In a distinguished career spanning over half a century, Nevitt Sanford has been internationally recognized as a preeminent scholar and pathfinding researcher concerning the psychological development of college students. In the discussion I had with him today, Professor Sanford reflected upon the importance of community during the college years, how colleges and universities have lost much of that community in the decades following the Second World War, and the importance of reestablishing community if higher education is to fully achieve its purposes. Dr. Sanford, you've written eloquently um, throughout your career about the importance of a sense of community in universities. What do you, what do you mean? The existence of an actual community. I mean, one in which, um, in which people care for each other and in which, in the main, they share the same values and, and uh, hopes and aspirations. I was uh, led to talk about the pre-war universities and um, my own college, Richmond College in Virginia, by uh, having observed and had reported to me so much unhappiness among today's students. Mm -hmm. Students, the graduate students at the Wright Institute um, moved around the campus a lot and they even conducted some formal studies of students and um, reported that there's a lot of loneliness around. They were reporting that students hardly knew how to make friends and that the old college bull session that was great stuff in mm -hmm. my day had practically disappeared. The students couldn't organize a, a reasonable discussion of the uh, issues that were bothering them. They, uh, they were in, in keen competition with each other for um, whatever it took to get a good job, get a good place in the job world, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, even, even at Stanford, before I left there, there were students who would, um, who would actually deny information to their roommates for fear that uh, the roommate might do better on, the, on an examination than he. So but I needn't tell counselors about the, the, the problems of today, but the contrast is with um, uh, a college like Richmond of the 20s. What was it like to be a student there? It was, um, it was to be uh, uh, among friends who cared for you. I belonged to a fraternity, I belonged to several athletic teams, I belonged to the debating society mm -hmm. and various other things. and. Um, the, the, the thing that I think helped me the most was the fact that these fellows were willing to straighten me out and to teach me things about how to get along in mm -hmm. the life of that time. So you felt with your peers a sense of nurturance and support and caring. What about the, I did relas I what did. About the relationships with faculty? <clears throat> um, much the same sort of thing. The faculty, I felt, were... Um, they were much freer than today's faculty mm -hmm. to talk about whatever they pleased. And uh, our great effort was to get them off the subject so that uh, we'd, there'd be less stuff that we could be examined on. Sure. And we, what we really wanted to know was what they thought about things that interested us. Mm -hmm. We wanted to know what they thought about the Soviet Union, about the Scopes trial, about H.L. Mencken, and mm -hmm. so on. And it wasn't difficult to get them off the subject. And I have noted that... Um, I remember it vividly at least 12 professors that I had at Richmond mm -hmm. between 1925 and 1929. And I think the reason they stand so well in my, in my mind is not because they were such rare individuals, but they reveal themselves. We well, got to know them, and sometimes they even got to know us. What kinds of arrangements would students and faculty get together to get that level of genuineness and authenticity? I think it was mainly the classrooms, which are not large. The classes were 20 to 25 or something mm -hmm. like that. And um, in the course of a quarter or semester, the professors would probably know all the students in that class by name. Mm -hmm. And they would sometimes meet in little knots mm -hmm. around the campus. They'd always speak to each other. <laughs> and we always greeted all everybody, uh, the students or faculty, as gentlemen. If there were more than one, mm -hmm. you know, as we, as we passed right. them, we'd just say, gentlemen. Yes. This, you know, in the Old South, the object of education was to make a gentleman out of us. Mm -hmm. However, 
uh, unlikely uh, that that could be. But I wanted to say that um, the professors were perfectly willing to um, to talk with us singly or in a group about anything. Mm -hmm. But I was much too shy to want to take any problems or issues to a, to a given professor. With whom would you work those out? Your friends? With, in with the my, my friends. Mostly in the fraternity they, they house? Be, yes, in, in the fraternity mostly, I think. Mm -hmm. Though I had, I had another friend who was a real intellectual. He became an important physicist in time. And he and I had a certain intellectual comradeship that mm -hmm. uh, was, was rare among the boys, um, mm -hmm. boys in the fraternity. School spirit was... Um, was high. I know we can get a cow can get a lot of people out for a football game, mm -hmm. but um, we regarded uh, our rivals in football mm -hmm. as, as the enemy. Mm -hmm. And um, when a game with William and Mary College, our traditional rival, was coming up, we uh, we regarded it as a kind of a holy war, and um, poured everything in, in, into that. You know, mm -hmm. and. Um, the context for for going into this would, would be that um, the question you may we you may want to go into this more lately. If we um, we had community, all right, at uh, Richmond, but we also had a lot of ethnocentrism. You see, we were still discriminating terribly uh, mm -hmm. against blacks. We were anti we were anti Catholic, and uh, black people, I would say, were so submerged that we never saw them except in menial roles, and uh, we thought this was, uh, this was natural. Which doesn't seem surprising when you think that it was not until John F. Kennedy's day mm -hmm. that there was to be the beginning of a real change sure. in that. And uh, not until Martin Luther King came along did we get a sense that things were really uh, beginning to roll on that front. Was the... Uh ideas about the what happened to you when you went to college was it to be a place which would work for an individual where you knew you could get help and support or did people think of it as going off to a chillingly competitive environment no it we uh, it, it was to um, to go because our families had gone and our mm -hmm. friends and relations had, had gone and it was the uh, and it was the thing to do and the um, as I said earlier, the conception of education came right out of Thomas Jefferson. You should learn to do all kinds of things. It mm -hmm. was a kind of a idea. You, you, you know, you should, were there to develop all of your capacities, mm -hmm. and particularly your capacities for enjoying life. Mm -hmm. And um, we were encouraged to go in for everything we had any time for at all. And the fact that you played on the football team <clears throat> did not mean that you couldn't be on the band at the same time mm -hmm. if, if, that was your, if that was your interest. And the important thing is that um, most of us didn't have a clue as to what we were going to do after college. Did that matter at that and, time? And it didn't matter. We believed and, and we're, we were quite sure that um, our families and friends would find job for us. That the thing to do was stay somewhere in the area mm -hmm. of uh, Richmond, or at least Virginia. And um, our family and friends would find jobs for us if it, if it came to that. Or if we got into trouble, they would take care of us. Mm -hmm. So and there was uh, some network of oh, there support oh, oh. and encouragement and protection, really, for people there who certain, went There certainly this. was, and there probably still is. And people were not moving around the way they do today, you know. Mm -hmm. When my son went to Carleton College in the 50s and came home after four years, he didn't keep in touch with anybody he'd met there. Hmm. Whereas if I were to go back to Richmond today, as a matter of fact, I was back there in May and uh, met old friends, and, 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 and we had both assumed that wherever we met mm -hmm. or whenever we met, we would still be the friends we were then. But young people today, I think, are not even looking for durable friendships, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't know how to develop them if they were. What was it like when you went to graduate school? Did that sense of community... Uh Remain. It did. I expected to find the, the same thing at Harvard, and did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really um, delighted to find that the, that the people I went to see at Harvard, the employment mm -hmm. office, the student housing office, uh, and, and so forth, these people had, had drilled into them, you are here to take care of these students. 
Mm -hmm. and the faculty had the same outlook. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't dare turn down a student's request uh, uh, for an appointment. Mm -hmm. to, um, there wasn't the formal office hours okay. situation? No, not, not, not at all. The, the faculty had, had a sense that their first duty was to be teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, there was plenty of research going on, yeah. but uh, the students were the center of, of the college and of the, uh, and of the graduate school. And um, the graduate students, since they knew they were in a system that worked and had a faculty that they could trust, mm -hmm. were not competitive with each other. So, but the central elements were the system worked, they could trust the people that were in charge of, of uh, their preparation. That is right. And that, that they could right. count on some help in being successful. Yes. And a consequence was that there wasn't the kind of the kind of competition of that you'd find among uh, uh, people in a given graduate school today. Mm -hmm. I made once again lifelong friends in that uh, in, in that graduate school, and my gosh, when it came to exams and so on, we helped each other in every way we could. Mm -hmm. Of course, the competition on the job market was very different than uh, what was it than, like than today. The, uh, the question was um, whether there were going to be any jobs at all. The chairman of the, uh, of the department, Dr. Boring, tried to dissuade students from going into psychology mm -hmm. because getting jobs would be very difficult, and uh, he didn't want to be in involved in that any more than he had to. Mm -hmm. so, this was uh, right at the time of the Depression? That was a, yeah, that was a, you know, went up to Harvard in 19, 1930, having, having spent a year at Columbia. Mm -hmm. That was not a very lo lovable place because it was so scattered, you know, in the, in, in the it's just a huge place and in, in the city and, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. But Harvard was still a community. In the psychology department, um, there were plenty of theoretical differences among the people, but um, there was civility. You know, there, there would be a, a colloquium in which mm -hmm. uh, opposing views were I I expressed. But I could I could detect no particular meanness against uh, in, directed against people mm -hmm. because one disagreed with them. One thing mm -hmm. you described, and you were talking about uh, your the world you lived in when you were an assistant professor, that there was a quality of support and everybody expected to make it. Yes, when I came to Berkeley as an assistant professor, it seemed to me generally assumed that anybody who was brought into this family mm -hmm. as an assistant professor would in time and in turn be, uh, uh, be promoted. And uh, as I've reported someplace, it was not until 1947 that any assistant professor ever hired at Berkeley was out instead of, uh, instead of up. What By the time we'd made these friendships and mm -hmm. close associations, the older professors were helping the younger ones um, mm -hmm. do whatever was necessary to, uh, to get tenure. If he couldn't teach, they taught him to teach. If he couldn't do research, they uh, found ways to, uh, mm. to help him. And what began to bring the change, the breakdown of this sense of family and support and encouragement and nurturance that you spoke about? Say, I would say chiefly the um, period beginning very soon after the war in, in which the federal government began to pour money into the universities for, uh, for training and research. And how did that begin to break down the sense of community? Well, because people began to compete with each other for these research grants. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very nice uh, I mean, as a way of advancing one's career to get some government support for research would be just a ticket. So mm -hmm. everybody wanted that kind of support. And then, uh, then also, the federal government was supporting an awful lot of training in psychology. And uh, we at Berkeley were, were after those training grants mm -hmm. and, um, in clinical psychology. And we rapidly expanded the department and brought in people who were not exactly in the same class with those who were there already because they were, they were so quickly uh, recruited and hired. Mm -hmm. and, um, then with all this money for training going to the clinical psychologists, the uh, experimentalists and the physiological psychologists felt that uh, they were being put a brushed aside and mm -hmm. they were not getting that due and, uh, and so on. And this led to a more competitive environment It really as did, well. oh sure. What has been the impact <clears throat> on undergraduate education? 
Uh, we've talked about the, the increasing lack of community for assistant professors and graduate students. What's been the impact on undergraduate life? Pretty devastating, I should say. You see, one, one uh, aspect of this was um, after the war with the money coming in, the universities competed for, for people. You mm -hmm. know, some stars had appeared on the, on, mm -hmm. on the horizon, young people, and the universities competed for their services, and they would promise them that they would not have to teach the elementary course, or they could teach, uh, if they yeah. <laughs> taught part of some required mm -hmm. course, then they could teach their specialty. They were given all sorts of uh, promising benefits. And it was seen as a benefit and, not to be involved in, in close yeah. undergraduate instruction. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. the, um, in, in fact, the department seemed to me to, to work as if it uh, would be, it would like not to have any undergraduate uh, at all. But mm -hmm. of course it had to because that's where its university budget mm -hmm. <coughs> mainly was directed to. But uh, the, un uh, the undergraduate course, the Psych 1A, had a thousand students in that class. Mm -hmm. And um, I know because I had to lecture to them some during the war when they, so many mm -hmm. people were off in the service. And um, how could you get acquainted with any students mm -hmm. like that? But a student, a class of 50 students would be conducted in the same way. There, there wouldn't be any, uh, any class discussion. So while size is a factor, there had been an element of formalism introduced at even a class of 50, which might so. have been manageable had lost the intimacy and the give yes, and, and take. And by this time, the professors were teaching their specialized areas. The, the mm -hmm. curriculum had proliferated all over the lot, and if you, somebody came up with a name for a course, why, well, mm -hmm. he, he could give it. So the and growth of disciplinary subspecialties and, and focused research programs was another component of the Oh, exactly. It made, it made these undergraduate classes less interesting to okay. students, but they had to take them anyway because they, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, wanted, to, um, they wanted to major, uh, etc. But well, it became a very cold place. Before the war, after 1940, I had very much a sense that the University of California, Berkeley, was a community. Mm -hmm. The Monroe Deutsch, the provost, could come out and make a speech, which he did, and everybody felt that he was speaking to them and for them. Mm -hmm. When have you heard anything like that on, uh, on one of our university campuses well, re there's, recently? There's not much of a sense of shared values anymore. That is People right. are <clears throat> much more committed to their disciplines, much less committed to their institutions. Yes, but when, when Deutsch was talking, he was talking, he had some core mm -hmm. human value that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, and not a, not, a, not a discipline or any uh, particular mm -hmm. aggregated discipline. He was talking about what we ought to be as human beings. There's a vision of what the product of higher education should be. I should and say. that vision was articulated. Yes. Okay. What can universities do now to begin to retrieve some of the uh, specialness and nurturance that you've described? Listen to the student personnel people. No, uh, and that's, it's going to be awfully hard to get any change in, in the university. The system that we have going now is, uh, my God, to, to change that would be something like changing the federal government from the kind we have to one like the British have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it, so much interest is vested in the roles that the professors are now taking mm -hmm. that um, it would be extremely difficult to... Uh, to, to, to make changes. There are people who work at it, you know. How do you begin to create the conditions within the modern liberal arts college and the modern university to create the sense of community? For change on the campus, the professors are not going to change in and of themselves. They got, that's got to be outside force mm -hmm. to, to get a change. How would you go about creating some of the conditions that might bring that change? It's hard to say, but what we need, of course, is to somebody to speak about higher education and the prospects for becoming more human again, the way Martin Luther King spoke. Mm -hmm. you, you know what we need is a revival. Mm -hmm. We need something like the religious revivals of the 1840s or the student acti activism of the mm -hmm. uh, 60s and Martin Luther King's thing. If somebody, or more than that, a, a lot of people could speak to those things mm -hmm. with the uh, impact that Martin Luther King had, it could make a difference. Because the people who've got, to, who've got to bring the force on the universities or the colleges have got to be the parents of students and, mm -hmm. and, and the friends and relations of students. 
Because well, they, they, have, they have the greatest stake in it, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, they're very rarely heard from. They, uh, their voices <laughs> are not raised and mm -hmm. they're not heard. They're all cowed by the, uh, uh, the fact that the university has the power to determine whether or not their son gets into medical school. And so you mustn't antagonize those fellows. What goals do you have for college education for young people? We should ask college students not what, do you, what are you going to do or what do you want to do, but what kind of person do you want to become? And to start the conversation in, in a way that will uh, provide some self-insight for, uh, for the student and get him to thinking a little bit about who he is and what he indeed might become. Mm -hmm. You know, now traditionally the liberal arts colleges have all had these wonderful statements Mm -hmm. about uh, what they were going to do mm -hmm. to develop the potentialities and, and, and to uh, in, 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 uh, instill the values of the great, of, of our great tradition. Mm -hmm. There's that story, you know, about a mother whose son went to Brown and uh, she read the catalog, you know, where it said it was going to teach him how to think for himself, to uh, be sensitive to the yeah. needs of other people, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And, and, uh, and the mother, a little bit skeptical, said, are you really going to do all these things? And he said, madam, we guarantee results, else we'll return the boy. <laughs>